I remember it vividly. The reports of the shooting, the faces of the victims, the name of the killer. I was 16 years old, growing up in the UK, when a gunman massacred 16 five- and six-year-old children and their teacher in an elementary school in Dunblane, Scotland, before killing himself. By the following year, first the Conservative UK government and then the Labour UK government had introduced two laws that banned almost all handguns in England, Scotland and Wales. 22 years later, in 2018, in the wake of the Parkland mass shooting in Florida, which left 14 teenagers and three adults dead, a group of survivors and family members from Dunblane wrote an open letter to the students of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland. They pointed out that after Dunblane, laws were changed, handguns were banned, and the level of gun violence in Britain is now one of the lowest in the world. They pointed out that since Dunblane, there had been no more school shootings in the UK. Because that's what happens in other countries when there is a gun massacre, a mass shooting. Lawmakers take action. Guns are restricted, regulated, banned even. A month after Dunblane in Port Arthur, Australia, there was a mass shooting in which 35 people were killed with an AR-15, the worst single-shooter mass killing in Australia's history. Within 12 days of that massacre, the Conservative Prime Minister of Australia unveiled a package of new measures to regulate the legal ownership of firearms, as well as a mandatory buyback of guns. And there has not been a single mass shooting in Australia since that awful day in Port Arthur. But unlike in Australia or Great Britain, we didn't take action here in America after Parkland in 2018, not at the federal level, or after Sandy Hook in 2012, the deadliest mass shooting at an elementary school in American history in which 26 people were killed, 20 of them kids between the ages of six and seven. And now, this week, we can tragically, shockingly, horrifically add Rob Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas to the list. On Tuesday, at least 19 children and two teachers were gunned down, murdered in class. The children were second, third and fourth graders. They just had an award ceremony earlier in the day and were set to go on summer break tomorrow. Instead, 19 children, eight, nine, and 10 year olds, and two of their teachers are never coming home. We now know some of their names. Nine year old Armory Joe Garza, 10 year old Javier Lopez, 10 year old Uzziah Garcia, 10 year old Annabel Guadalupe Rodriguez, 10 year old Jose Flores, and two teachers, Eva Morales and Eva Morales, an educator of 17 years and her co-teacher, Irma Garcia, who taught there for 23 years. <sighs> All gone. Hospitals in the area say they've treated dozens of victims, though the exact number of injuries hasn't been released at this time. For hours, frantic parents and relatives desperately waited on word about their children, many of them waiting outside of the civic center in Uvalde. Reporters on scene Tuesday described the screams they heard from inside the center as these parents got the news that no parents should ever have to hear. This mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas comes less than two weeks after the mass shooting in Buffalo, New York. We're literally still burying the dead from that massacre and now yet another predictable tragedy in the United States of America. As Politico put it, mass shootings have become America's copy and paste tragedy. All you've got to do is change out the name of the place and the number dead. Again, nowhere else on earth does this happen with this kind of regularity. In fact, according to a database by Education Week, there have been 27 school shootings this year alone. To say nothing of those mass shootings, not at a school, for example, the one in Buffalo just days ago. And Americans, including President Joe Biden, are asking, when will enough be enough? As a nation, we have to ask, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? When in God's name we do what we all know in our gut needs to be done? We often hear from the gun lobby that all you need to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Here's the thing, and I don't want to talk about the shooter in Texas or the shooter in Buffalo. We're certainly not naming them. 
But there is a very important commonality here to point out. Both used assault-style weapons, and both encountered law enforcement at the start of their rampages. You know, the good guys with guns. Trained police officers, though, couldn't bring them down right away. In Buffalo, that was partly because the shooter wore body armor. Yeah, body armor, according to authorities. There was no body armor in Texas, but the authorities there say the shooter did wear a tactical vest. But whatever they were wearing, the point is that the good guy with a gun was there and wasn't enough. And yet for many in the Republican Party, the solution to these massacres is more guns. Just listen to Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. We can't stop bad people from doing bad things. They're going to violate murder laws. They're not going to follow gun laws. I've never understood that argument. But we are. We can't harden these schools. We can uh, create points of access that are difficult to get through. We can potentially arm and prepare and train uh, teachers and other administrators to respond quickly. Because the reality is we don't have the resources to, to have law enforcement at every school. Yes, arm teachers, the same teachers that Republicans don't trust to teach history. That's the way forward. Another common refrain from Republicans, one that came from Paxton and Texas Senator Ted Cruz just hours after the shooting, is don't politicize this. Don't politicize this? Mass shootings are a political problem. They are a product of bad laws. And so they require a political solution, a legislative solution. Oh, and when the likes of Paxton say gun laws won't work, they're ignoring literally the rest of planet Earth. There is a reason that the United States is the only country in the world to have a mass shooting every single year for the past 20 years. The only country. And that reason is not video games. It's not an abundance of evil in America and nowhere else. And it's not mental health either. As Democratic Senator Chris Murphy pointed out last night. Spare me the about mental illness. We don't have any more mental illness than any other country in the world. You cannot explain this through a prism of mental illness because we don't, we're not an outlier on mental illness. We're an outlier when it comes to access to firearms and the ability of criminals and very sick people to get their hands on firearms. That's what makes America different. That's what makes America different. It's the ease of access to weapons. It's our hundreds of millions of guns and our lack of gun laws. We need our politicians to change this because a lot of Americans, the majority in fact, are ready for change. When are we gonna do something? I'm tired, I'm, I'm so tired of getting up here and offering condolences to, to the devastated families that are out there. I'm so tired of the, excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm tired of the moments of silence. Enough. 90% of Americans, regardless of political party, want background check, universal background check. 90% of us, we are being held hostage by 50 senators in Washington who refuse to even put it to a vote, despite what we, the American people, want. They won't vote on it because they want to hold on to their own power. It's pathetic. I've had enough. Like NBA coach Steve Kerr, I am fed up with lawmakers who don't want to address the issue of guns, who just want to call for moments of silence or for thoughts and prayers. You know, every morning when I drop my kids to school, I do a silent prayer that, please, God, today not be the day a mass shooter goes into their school. And you know what? There is no other country in the Western world where a parent has to offer that prayer when they drop their kid off for school. So how about we come together finally to put pressure on our politicians, especially our Republican politicians, our hostage takers, to quote Steve Kerr, in order to finally create an America where we don't have to offer that prayer in the morning before school and we don't have to offer thoughts and prayers for massacred kids after school. How about that? Joining me now to discuss all of this and more is Igor Volsky, the executive director of Guns Down America and the author of Guns Down, How to Defeat the NRA and Build a Safer Future with Fewer Guns. Also with us, Julian Castro, former Democratic presidential candidate who served as Barack Obama's secretary of housing and urban development. He is the former mayor of San Antonio, Texas, plus criminology professor Gillian Peterson of Hamline University, who has studied every mass shooting since 1996, using every single one using Justice Department data. She's also the co-founder of The Violence Project, as well as a co-author of a book 
by the same name. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, Gillian, let me start with you. You're one of the most prominent experts on mass shootings in this country. So what do we know about these tragedies? I'm sure you get asked this every time. What can we do to prevent them? Anything? You know, it's like the same story over and over and over again. We see these really common trajectories in these perpetrators' lives. They're often experience really extreme trauma in childhood, things like physical abuse, sexual abuse, which kind of lays the soil. And then you see these perpetrators develop into young men who are full of kind of self-hate, despair. Um, oftentimes they are attempting suicide, they're isolated, and then that despair and self-hate turns outward. And it's whose fault is this? And these mass shootings are suicides in addition to homicides, but they're these angry suicides that are meant to take as many people as possible to make the biggest headlines. And then of course, these young men who do this, typically students of the school, 15 to 18, they have access to firearms, either because they just turned 18 and can go by them or because they're taking firearms from their parents and relatives. Julian, have a listen to what Texas Representative Tony Gonzalez had to say about the shooting this morning. You have voted against two gun, gun reform measures, uh, including one that, that called for expanded background checks. Are you rethinking that position this morning in light of what has happened? In your, in you know, your I'm happy to debate. Uh, I'm happy to debate policy, uh, not today. Julian, today Senator Ted Cruz also criticized Democrats for politicizing the shooting. But if now is not the time to talk about changing gun policy, when is? Well, now is the time, many, and this is part of the NRA's blueprint to try and uh, get past the intense emotion of this event and the calls for change and any impetus and feeling that we have to do this and let it die down until basically we stay with the status quo. That has been their strategy for years and years, and it has worked. Uh, we can't let that work. Uh, we have to push forward. We have to call for change. We have to recognize that this is an issue that is going to be uh, solved in the political process. And so by nature, it's political. What he's doing, what Representative Gonzalez is doing, is simply parroting the NRA, and his constituents should not stand for that. Yes, indeed. And Igor, let me bring you in. It, is, it says everything about America that you and I first discussed you coming on the show last week after Buffalo. And by the time we got you on the show, we have another mass shooting, another gun massacre. You went viral, Igor, a few years back for a series of tweets you did revealing how much money American lawmakers accept from gun lobbyists. Will gun policy in America change as long as these, as long as these millions of dollars continue to change hands? You know, Mandy, what's shocking to me is that I went viral with those tweets in 2015 and 2016. I called out Republicans for sending out thoughts and prayers and doing nothing to prevent gun violence when they had the chance. And now I find myself in a situation where I'm calling out Democrats, Democrats in power, like President Biden, like Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, for not having a plan, not having a vision, not having a timetable to uh, take the actions that are necessary to help prevent these kinds of massacres. You know, we talked after Buffalo because I was so frustrated that when the president went to Buffalo and gave his condolences to that community, that he didn't make any commitments that this would be a priority to him. And the same thing happened last night when he addressed the nation. There was no sense, no tangible next steps that he told us he would be taking. He didn't tell us that he would be opening a White House office of gun violence prevention that survivors have been asking for for years, or that he would be uh, Just calling senators personally, lobbying them to make progress. Eagle, Eagle let that? me jump in, because a, a lot of people watching at home will be saying, come on, Igor, they don't have the votes. There's a filibuster. You can't blame the Democrats for this. This is on Republicans. What specifically would you want Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer to be doing right now? Yeah, I'll tell you what. I want Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer to put up a fight. I want them to break this cycle of expectation that we have that after a mass shooting, nothing happens. I want Joe Biden to seize this moment of leadership and raise the bar 
for what it means for a president to respond to a mass shooting. Listen, he may lose that fight because of the factors you cite, but he will be putting lawmakers on record, and he will be telling voters to whom he promised in 2020 that this would be a priority, that he at least tried to deliver. And that will help him yeah. politically in 2022, but it will also send a signal that the old way of doing politics of just saying pretty words are over. That's important. So let me bring Gillian back into this discussion. I mentioned Gillian to Igor a moment ago that we were going to have him on last week after Buffalo. By the time we got him on the show, there's another massacre. When you have these mass shootings so close together, how contagious, I know that's a word often used by some experts, how contagious is this kind of violence? And how do we in the media report on these tragedies without contributing to that, I don't know, social contagion factor? Yeah, there's good evidence to show that these shootings are socially contagious. So they tend to cluster. When one happens, you see another one or two or even three happen quite quickly. And it seems to be that individuals who are kind of on the edge, who are thinking about this, who are planning this, see the intense media coverage that comes with one before them and try to emulate, emulate it. So it's about not giving these perpetrators the stage that they're looking for. These are public performances meant to go yeah. viral, meant to get us to read their manifestos and watch their videos. And so if we can really take that stage away from them, focus on victims, focus on policy change, that's much better. Yeah. Focus on the victims, not the perpetrator. Focus on what we can do, hopefully, to change things. Julia, let me talk to you and say, Governor Greg Abbott of Texas, Republican governor, have a listen to him announcing the news of the shooting. He shot and killed horrifically, incomprehensibly, uh, 14 students uh, and killed a teacher. The same Greg Abbott tweeted in 2015, I'm embarrassed Texas is number two in nation for new gun purchases behind California. Let's pick up the pace, Texans, uh, with a uh, at NRA at the end of it. I mean, when you look at that kind of rhetoric, is it incomprehensible that shootings, mass shootings happen in America when politicians want us to be buying more guns, circulating more guns, getting more guns? Yeah, Greg Abbott is maybe the worst example of a politician who has fostered and uh, given rise to this permissive, anything goes dangerous gun culture. He's done that here in Texas with his rhetoric, like you mentioned on Twitter and social media, but also most importantly, uh, by relaxing laws to try and keep us safer, whether it was permitless carry or open carry, any number of pieces of legislation that have made it easier for guns to get into the hands of dangerous folks, and also these assault-style weapons with high-capacity magazines that are themselves dangerous and don't belong on the streets. Uh, and then, to top that off, in his press conference, he tries to just focus on mental health. Uh, look, I, I agree that mental health is part of this, but in other countries, they also have mental health problems with their people. Yes. What they don't have is they don't have access to these types yes. of weapons, or in some places, any weapons at all. Uh, so that's what makes us unique in the United States of America. And Greg Abbott today and every day wants to address every other single problem except the actual problem of guns. Finally, Mehdi, let me just say, even on his argument of mental health, look, that is an issue in our society. You know what? He took several hundred million dollars just recently out of the Health and Human Services budget of Texas and transferred it over to his debacle Operation Lone Star at the border, so, just to play his yeah. own politics. So he's a hypocrite yeah. on top of it's a very an good ineffective, point. you know, policymaker. It's a very good point. Even if it's about mental health, which it's not, it's about guns, but even on mental health, they're not spending the money or investing in it. Eagle, Greg Abbott this Friday is going to be in Houston, Texas for the NRA annual meeting. Uh, irony of irony, or some might say hypocrisy of hypocrisy. Donald Trump will be there, the former president. Ted Cruz will be there. Uh, John Cornyn, the other Texas senator, I believe, will also be there. Ironically, again, or hypocritically, the NRA website says firearms are not permitted in the hall uh, while Donald Trump is speaking. Uh, first of all, shouldn't they have canceled that event by now? And what is your reaction to them not allowing firearms in their own NRA meeting? 
Oh, absolutely. The event should be canceled. But then again, these are politicians, the ones you mentioned, who have built an entire brand and identity in appealing to the radical folks at the NRA. And it doesn't matter how many lives those kinds of policies cost. What matters is their ambition and their power. And so that's what it's about to them. And, you know, the NRA, in terms of not allowing guns into that pavilion, particularly when Trump is speaking, they're simply following the science on this, which says conclusively that where there are more guns, there are more gun deaths. So for all you hear about from, from the NRA and from Republicans about that gun-free zones, draw gun violence, and invite mass shooters, here you obviously have a situation where they're creating a gun-free zone because that actually uh, makes you more safe, not less. Before we run out of time, uh, Julian, I do want to get you to react in particular to the video coming out of Texas today of Beto O'Rourke, who is the Democratic candidate uh, for governor uh, in this state, interrupting the sitting Republican governor, Greg Abbott, who we mentioned, his press conference earlier today alongside Ted Cruz and others. I should also point out before we play that clip, John Cornyn will not be at the NRA annual meeting on Friday, but Ted Cruz, Greg Abbott and Donald Trump will be. And let's play the clip. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. S sit down. You're out of you're out of line and an embarrassment. Hey. S sit down. I don't play this stuff. Next shooting is right now, and you are doing nothing. No. He needs to give his out of here. This isn't the place to talk to us over. This is totally predictable. When you sir, you're out of line. Sir, you are out of line. Sir, you are out of line. Please leave this auditorium. I can't believe you're a sick s would come to a deal like this to make a political issue. Put aside the Republican rhetoric there that we heard from the stage. Don't make it a political issue. It is a political issue, as we discussed a moment ago. What do you make of Beto O'Rourke behaving in that direct manner? A lot of people at home watching will say, this is what we want from Democrats. This is kids are dead. The time for discussing reforming the filibuster over. We need much more direct rhetoric and action. Absolutely. Look, uh, good for him. I think we need more people in a civil way to offer up this kind of protest and not let these guys uh, who are refusing to take the measures we know need to be taken to keep children safer, families safer, not let them get away with their NRA blueprint responses and pretend like everything's fine, not put forth a, a plan of action uh, and let the status quo continue uh, for years and years, and we see more of these deaths. So, you know, Beto O'Rourke, of course, he's involved with Greg Abbott in a campaign right now, and that is, I'm sure, uh, you know, an issue that is going to become more and more prominent after today. So good for him for making this an issue. And I'll just say, as, as somebody who ran for office, that might look easy, but it actually does take a lot of guts as, a, as somebody running for office to go into that situation knowing that you're going to get a lot of pushback uh, from those yeah. guys up there on that die. So uh, I hope that it makes this issue even more prominent in that campaign. Just uh, just listening to the voices on the stage, they seem angrier about Beto O'Rourke interrupting them than about a massacre in their state. Just seems like that. Igor Volsky, Julian Castro, Gillian Peterson, thank you all for your time.